In 1865, slavery was abolished in the United States. The United States Constitution was amended to include three provisions that granted newly freed blacks legal status. However, state law and actions by private individuals prevented the integration of blacks and whites in many areas, including transportation, recreational facilities, the armed forces, and public schools around the country. In 1896, the Supreme Court legalized the separation of blacks and whites in Plessy v. Ferguson and upheld the constitutionality of separate but equal facilities. There was no immediate um, benefit to the Supreme Court decision, you know, that was, uh, that impacted you the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year. It wasn't until later, you know, that all those things began to sort of be forced into play. During the early 1950s, many Southern states, including Florida, began launching efforts to equalize their educational facilities for blacks. The South believed that if it ensured schools were equal in form, they could maintain the separate aspect of public education and maintain segregated schools. I think that what segregation gave black communities was a sense of unity. You had a common enemy, right? It was the Anglo-American community. You had to um, bond together to make things happen for yourselves, right? Um, if you were going to send your kids to school, you had to, you know, get a high school for the community. You had to go come together to argue and to fight for a high school. So it bonded people together. If you lived in the same neighborhoods, you supported black businesses. So it gave African Americans a strong sense of pride and unity. Because of Miami's urbanization and high rate of northern migration and tourists, the city had a less hostile racial environment than was seen in other areas of Florida and the South. However, Miami's tourist veneer often shielded the reality of the plight African Americans faced. The upcoming battles fought on the road to public facility and school integration would soon pierce that shield. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Miami chapter led the way in South Florida toward ending Jim Crow laws and implementing the Brown ruling. Theodore R. Gibson was elected as the head of the Miami chapter of the NAACP in 1956. Reverend Gibson learned that black ministers yielded a higher level of respect from white leaders and were often able to advocate on behalf of their communities through their positions. Anytime we had a major issue, there were several people that we can count on, and Father Gibson was one of those people. He, uh was one of the first blacks to serve on the Miami City Commission, mm -hmm. you know, and he was always a civil rights activist, not, you know, in the Coconut Grove, and really for the city of Miami, not only for blacks, but also for those who were discriminated against. Because of Gibson's status as a middle-class professional, the white leaders in the community were more willing to hear his suggestions. Through his status and reputation, Gibson and other leaders in the community opened lines of communication that led to desegregating Miami. He was fearless. He stood up and he talked about the issues. He had difficult times. I know he did, but he still, he held his ground. Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, was a landmark Supreme Court case decided in 1954. Brown was a class action lawsuit filed by black parents in Topeka, Kansas, on behalf of their children who were forced to attend segregated schools. Daddy was always filing lawsuits. That was his thing, because he said that he was gonna live in Mississippi and that he was not going to have anyone to run him out because he was going to make the best place for his children. The then civil rights lawyer, Thurgood Marshall, challenged the foundations for the justifications of racial segregation in the previous Supreme Court ruling of separate but equal, established in Plessy versus Ferguson. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, racial segregation of public schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. 
Brown provided the legal foundation and inspiration for the American civil rights movement that unfolded over the next decade. However, enforcement of the court's ruling proved to be another challenging battle for civil rights leaders and the American public. My mother was cleaning up in white people's houses, and when she would go to work the next day, they said they loved mama, but her husband, that nigga, is nothing but an agitator, and I'm sorry, you cannot come back. The first thing that happened was uh, the big thing down in Alabama when Martin Luther King went down there and raised hell. We had leaders here, we had Father Gibson, or uh, I remember when I got on the police department and uh, I was new and we rode around the grove and we checked all the churches because it was said that they was going to blow up the churches. So I truly remember a lot about those, those children and how devastated it was when they did that bombing of those kids for no reason and in a church. That was devastating, not just to me, but all over the country and especially all over in the South. The court's second decision in Brown urged localities to act on the new principles promptly and to move forward in full compliance with the court's orders with all deliberate speed. There's a famous phrase that was that the Supreme Court issued relating to that. It should be done with it should be done with all deliberate speed, and it was not. That there were there were major efforts to uh, to hinder that, to block it. But that meant that they could go at their own pace. Ten years later, like 1964, only two percent of all formerly segregated schools had even been desegregated. So it's really it's not until 1964 that you get to see some real movement with integration across the country and also in um, Miami. 1964 happens, right? It's the Civil Rights Act, and it includes provisions that allows the federal government to punish schools if they don't, um, if they don't comply with desegregation. So what that means is they can take your funding away, a, a very scary thing. So all of the plans that counties have been working on for years, ostensibly to desegregate, um, they really have to make it happen. By the late 1950s, Florida was one of only seven states not to have implemented desegregation. It was not until 1959, five years after Brown, that African Americans began enrolling in all-white public schools. The Dade County School Board began to make plans for voluntary desegregation in 1958. Freedom of choice was a plan which allowed um, black students or, and white students, students of any race, to enroll in any school that they wanted to by choice. And what you saw prior to the massive desegregation moments where the county is moving people around is a handful of people um, integrating some of the predominantly white schools. They put us one in a class because they thought we would, you know, start something or whatever. So they just put one black in each class. There were a lot of blacks who really were satisfied with the neighborhood and wanted the kid, black kids to stay at the black schools because they knew that black teachers were excellent role models and teachers and they all lived in the same neighborhood where we all grew up and all. And there was this close relationship between parent and teacher. And really, they were satisfied with the way things were. Um, those students recall really horrible experiences after they enrolled in those schools. In 1956, Gibson versus Dade County School Board initiated the movement toward actual desegregation of Dade County schools. The battle that then began drew the lines between the more progressive culture in Miami and the Old South Southern mentality of the opposition. You had the federal marshals that were, you know, sort of being utilized at that point to force, you know, these things uh, into compliance because Florida was one of those states that was just determined that they were going to stay with the status quo um, as well as, you know, the Alabamas and the Mississippis and the, you know, South Carolinas, et cetera, et cetera. My sister was the first African-American to integrate the University of Mississippi following James Meredith. Um, when she would walk into uh, her first classes, they would holler, here come the nigga, here come the nigga, here come the nigga. They would throw food all over her. One of the famous uh, football players' uh, father was her classmate. And he was one of those people 
who were um, hollering, here come the nigger one night, and told them that uh, all he, she could do for him was to uh, fan him and serve him. Mint julep that she needed to be in a cotton field. During that summer of 66, when it, it, it began to be reality for myself that the next year, my 11th grade year in high school, I was gonna be going into an integrated environment. Um, it was very, very, very stressful, very stressful. Lower courts across the country issued desegregation orders to school districts. School districts were required to open their doors to all students regardless of race. They were forced Okay, it's either you, you, you will do this right now. And so, you know, as a, re, as a result of that, there was no game plan. I didn't even know we were going. It was actually a surprise to me. Um, they woke us up one morning and said, we got a new school we're going to. We didn't even know. I remember doing the summer, that particular summer, you know, a, a letter came to the house saying, you going to Southwest High School. What? You know, Southwest High School. I didn't even know where Southwest High School was. We were horrified. All of us was like, where are we going? You know, the, 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 the week that they told us that we were going to be transferred from Carver to Gable Senior High, we was like, uh-uh, I'm not going. I'm just dropping out, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going over there for them to laugh at us. But that's how Florida was doing that, you know, that time. They, they didn't come into this willingly. It was like, you know, they were forced to, and as a result, they just haphazardly threw everybody out there and said, okay, all right, let's, it, it, well, we gotta do this, let's, here it is, you know. And so that's why you had such a uh, cataclysmic, if you will, uh, level of conflict and, and everything else because nobody on either side really had any time to sort of have a digestive period that said this is what's coming prepare yourself and you know it's going to happen you know in stages it was just overnight it was a mess when we first went to Gables it was a mess go home niggers they had to have the police there as we you know, exited the school buses and preparing to come go into the school, we were all searched by the National Guards during that time because uh, someone said that they had received information that we were carrying weapons and there, there was going to be riots and these other issues and problems. But we knew nothing about it, and of course, you know, we had, we knew nothing of, of that because no one had planned anything of that nature. So that was our first day and our welcome to uh, the new school. It was a lot of stares and uh, people just, you know, uh, conversations ceasing. You know, we were walking kind of like groups. You know, we stuck with most of our friends. We had nobody else because they didn't speak to us. They didn't talk to us at all. You know, you had some kids that would pass by and say, good morning. Some people would pass by and say, good morning. You know, but most of the time, they were black clouds. Oh, here come the black clouds walking down the hallway. Um, they would stick their feet out and make us trip. They would throw books down, piles of their books they would throw down on the ground in the hallways for us to fall. Some of the teachers looked at them, especially the female teachers, looked at the guys differently than they look at the girls. Because when you look at a guy, a black guy, especially if he's a tall guy, husky guy, what have you, they're going to think right then and there, you know, they're up to something. They're doing something. So they used to always get in trouble. And every time you turn around, they were getting in trouble for little things that didn't make sense. They were getting suspended, put out of school. So eventually, they dropped out. And I believe if they were still in the neighborhood, it would have been a different story because the parents were allowed to come in, talk to those students with the teachers. But when you were at Gables, they didn't communicate that well with the parents. They didn't have that communication open that well. 
And I think that's what was lacking. I believe if they would have had that, those students would have stayed in school. Desegregation meant redrawing school boundary lines, leading to busing of students, usually black students, to schools outside of their neighborhoods. Busing is Dade County's way of achieving unitary status. That's actually a, a sort of a term they had to achieve according to the federal government. Unitary status meant that you were considered a fully integrated school. You had met the mandates of the federal government. Until you acquired that status, you were going to be under um, under supervision. You know, uh, you're going to be you were going to be watched. You were potentially some subject to penalization. You know, for not meeting integration mandates. And what the th Miami-Dade County school system is realizing by the late '60s is that just closing a few uh, senior high black high schools and bringing the black high, high, black high school students into the white schools in the neighborhood, and just cl uh, closing a few junior high I mean, bringing a few white students into the black, formerly black junior high schools is not enough. So like a lot of states in other parts of the country, they begin to um, implement busing as a way of really ach achieving unitary status, as a way of becoming fully integrated. So students are being moved from South Dade into, you know, uh, to, to Carver, to places all, they're really being moved all over the city. And that's, the, and it was both white students and black students. I met so many friends from other cities located south of where we are. I'm talking about South Miami, Goose, Perrine, Naranja, Florida City, Homestead, because all of those kids during that time had to be bussed up to Carver. And I think about that all the time, and that must have been hard for them. When you got a school in your neighborhood, and none of the black kids could go to that school. That's bad. You know, you got black kids right in that neighborhood, but they have to be bussed out to another school. Now, that's not fair. We could walk to school, but they had to catch the bus. And I remember that a lot of those kids, they had a uh, bus load one and bus load two. So naturally those who were assigned to the first bus had to get up even earlier to get that and the bus driver had to go back down south and get the other load of kids we had children that were bused from richmond heights every morning to carver the other day i was talking to a man who was fixing my cable box and he went to um, he went to north miami high school but he grew up four blocks from northwestern but this is a time when they were busing this kid to North Miami High School, when in that, in that community, in that neighborhood, being a Northwestern bull was a, one of the biggest things you could possibly be. And he was denied that because, because of an integration policy that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Black communities felt that they were being unfairly asked to move more than white students were. And white, student, white parents, of course, were, had real issues with their students being bused, with their children being bused into black neighborhood schools. So there were protests at the county level, there were protests at the school level, at the point, at the point where busing um, is implemented and it's actually happening, there is lots of violence in the schools itself, people are not getting along very well. The students, I think, are very much reacting to what's going on civically in the city. Students who made the transition into desegregated schools faced unfamiliar faces, both in and outside the classroom. Some also feared that academic expectations would be higher or that they wouldn't measure up to their white peers. We were told all our life that we was three years behind them. I was not a child that grew up to believe that. My dad said everything that anybody else could do, you can do just as well or better. So don't you go over there thinking you're three years behind nobody because you're not. Students who attended formerly all black schools no longer had the support of black teachers who had helped mold their success. You had teachers that weren't that pleased with us coming into Gables. So you had teachers that really were not that um, happy to deal with us. We thought they were always on, on uh, their side. We always had the Carl Gables side and the black side. And it was always their side and uh, it was always for their advantage. I do recall my mother speaking one time with a friend who's, who was expressed some negativity 
and this friend said, you know, Altanzas will never get the grades that she actually deserves. They won't give her the grades that she deserves. The hard part about it was that a lot of the black teachers that we had you know, grown up with, um, who been there at the school for so many years, they were not transferred over to the new school because there already was um, a full staff of teachers there. So we ended up losing a lot of the really good uh, black teachers during that transition period. Nobody was there to look out for us anymore. We didn't have those teachers there to look out for us. We experienced um, uh, 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 an influx uh, of teachers coming in uh, to, um, to our schools that really, really, really uh, uh, meant nothing uh, to us. The teachers, uh, they didn't know us. We didn't know them. They didn't know what to expect from us. We didn't know what to expect from them. Uh, the, the two different classic cultures. Those teachers that came into our school systems that weren't for us, didn't mean anything, they, they, they had hard times. They got cast out and most times they wanted to leave. Those teachers that meant something to us, I'll never forget Mr. Ashcraft. Mr. Ashcraft, uh, an Anglo instructor, he came in and he said, I am serious about this. He gave me my first D. I got a D. And he said, you got a D, Richard, because you're not doing what I want you to do. Once you do what, and I understood and ended up being one of his top students. Ash, Mr. Ashcraft stayed with us. He stuck with us. I, I did find uh, uh, a teacher who believed in me. I found two teachers that believed in me. Obviously, the uh, chorus teacher and a, a government teacher. Her name was Ms. Rapp. Ms. Rapp, we thought she was the meanest person in the world. She turned out to be the, the most uh, motivational person that I could, could ever meet. She's probably responsible for me going back to grad school. Overall, I do believe that um, we prospered because of opportunity, uh, especially in the education field. Uh, job markets opened, people were able to get better jobs, therefore provide on a different level for their families. I thought that I would get a, a better education uh, preparing me for college because you hear all kind of rumors. We knew we had, at Gables, they had uh, new books and we would usually have uh, hand-me-down books or second-hand books. So all of this plays a part in it, so I wanted to, I thought I was ready to go over uh, to Gables and, and wanted to experience it. As an adult now, looking back at those days, the education has, was better. It was. Orchard Villa Elementary became the first integrated school in Florida. The school board had assigned 359 black students to the school and a black principal. However, Orchard Villa soon became a nearly all black school because of white flight. One of the things, that the problems that came about with the integration was that eventually, bit by bit, many of the white families moved away. A number of Miami-Dade County parents during that period of time end up pulling their students out of public school because of those, that chaos. Some of the fight that I recall came from that particular group, from the white parents, that they did not want the integration. and. It was demonstrated, they voiced their opinion, and then it was further demonstrated by many of them pulling their children from out of the public school system and also setting up private schools and sending the place, placing the kids in the private school. Carl Gables was better than any private school in the, in the 60s. And um, so why did it happen? There, there, I think there was a fear, there was a fear that happened because in some schools there was some violence. Over time, the community changed more and more, whereas Carl Gables became more Hispanic. It became, um, and then, the, the, so the, it, you know, I don't know what the population of Gables High is today, but uh, traditional Anglo-American, non-Hispanic Anglo-American is probably 20%, 25%, you know, I, I would guess. You know, when I was there, it was probably 70%.
that changed because the demographics of Miami changed, and I suspect people in, a, in higher economic brackets who could afford private schools says, that scares me, and they went elsewhere. So now you have economic discrimination. And so the latest rendition of that in terms of its you know, um, manifestations are the reverse of the other. Okay, I tried, and I'm just giving you this as, a, as a, an analogy. I tried integration because I was forced to do it, and let's just call it a failure. So I don't want it anymore. So now I want to be able to, you know, I live in Coral Gables. I live in Bell Harbor. I live wherever I live, but I'm affluent. I have options and choices. I don't want my child in an inner city urban environment with, quote, those other people. So in effect, as long as you have that mentality, you will never have integration. The transition from segregation to integration was harder for some than it was for others. Dade County provided little oversight regarding the integration process. It, it was awkward for me at first because is it really true? Uh, these these uh, prejudice and, and uh, thoughts and attitudes, but I found it wasn't. You know, nobody taught me that. It just, my, I just experienced it. These white kids, parents had told them that black people were this and black people were that. And when they started mingling with us and going to school with us and coming to our homes and we going into their homes and doing different things together, they found out that we weren't no different than they were. They found out that, my God, why did you lie? You know, these people are not like you said they are. They're not violent, they're not vicious, they're not dirty, they're not stink, they're not nasty, they're not all these things that you have made us believe. You see, so it did make a change. We perhaps were seen as unwilling to learn or unable to learn or want, not wanting to work and being lazy. And through integration, I think they saw that we could learn, were eager about learning and achieving things. Uh, I think it helped tremendously, not just for us to get to know whites or other ethnic groups differently, but they to know us differently. Especially when you go to a white school and kids got their own cause, you know, they're doing their own thing. And then we had to come and deal with, you know, our circumstances. It wasn't that we, you know, we was ashamed of our circumstances, you know what I'm saying? Actually, we were very happy in our environment. It's only when we're not allowed to, to grow within our own community, and that, that's where the, the problem was, you know, with the desegregation. Coconut Grove was very vibrant, and a lot was happening in Coconut Grove. We had bars, we had clubs, which we don't have now, at none at all. I think what caused the majority of that here in the Grove is the fact that we got somehow another geographically, we got caught right in the middle of the, the richest white people in the world. You got Carl Gables, you got Miami Beach. I had, I had grown up as a little kid playing sports, so I had always known if you wanted to play basketball, the best place to play it was not the Carl Gables on the tree, but was at the Southwest Boys Club. You know, you didn't go to the Carl Gables Youth Center, you went to the Southwest Boys Club, and that's where all the kids played from the Grove, the, and, and as well as the kids from Carl Gables, and that was where the best basketball was played. So you, when you're a nine-year-old, if you wanted to get any good in basketball, you, you went to Southwest Boys Club and you played at Southwest Boys Club. They respected us, but we earned that respect. It wasn't given, you understand? But, but because of the competitiveness in us, they, they, they adjusted. In the, in the early 60s, high school football was a big deal down here. There was no Miami Dolphins. The University of Miami wasn't any good. And you, the Gables-Miami High game would have 40 or 50,000 people in the Orange Bowl. You know, I played in those games. I mean, it was a big deal. There was a legendary coach at Gables High, Nick Cody's, who was considered one of the great coaches of all time. In 65, they didn't win the state championship. And he, in 66, he knew he was going to have a rebuilding year. And that's when integration was happening at the high school. He started a black quarterback by the name of Craig Curry as a junior over some white kids who had waited their turn, but who clearly weren't, weren't as good as Craig Curry. In a year that he knew he was going to lose a couple of games, 
because he just wasn't, it was a rebuilding year. And he got a, a lot of pressure that year as a coach to, to not do that. And he stood firm. And if you talk to Craig Curry today, he went on to become all Big Ten at Minnesota and is, is I think, he was on the academic advisors at, at University of Michigan. If you talk to Craig Curry, he, he'll tell you about what, how, what difference Nick Cody's made to the, to the integration of, of Gables High. Because the next year, they were very good, and he was the star quarterback, and they win the state championship. And along with a number of other kids from the Grove and, uh, that, that would never have gone to Gables High five years earlier. The coach picked the best players. Right out of Car Gables, we have a number of professional football players to come from uh, Car Gables Senior High. And um, so just a whole bunch of them has done well. We saw both sides. We saw at a point where we, we feared it because of the, the fear of the unknown. We didn't know what was happening. Uh, and then we thought uh, that it would be something good. For example, uh, I can recall football players receiving secondhand shoes from Carl Gables Senior High School. Now we're saying, guess what? We're about to get some of the new facilities we're going to be involved with uh, new uh, football pads. Uh, it's a new adventure. So we saw it in both ways. The cultural climate during the transition from segregation to desegregation in Dade County was not simple. The transition embodied both the depths of uncertainty, turmoil, and frustration, and the heights of hope, ambition, and perseverance. You know, integration, the way it's been, is, is it, it was forced. And I think one would be a fool if he or she didn't realize that people, are, generally speaking, they don't like to be force-fed anything. Uh, but it's just, it's a growing pain. It's a growing pain. And okay, well, we're, we're, we're going to be hurting this week, but maybe next week we'll be a little bit better and, and, and so forth down the road. I think you would have had to have lived through the experience to truly understand how difficult it was. Um, you know, children today, they, they can see the videos and the films and, and everything, but until you actually, when you walk through that and experience that, there really is nothing else that you can compare it to. And if the system had not changed and if it was not integrated, I just can't even imagine what society would be like today. And from a historical standpoint, I looked at it from my father's perspective. I looked at it from my grandfather's perspective. I looked at it from my great-grandfather's perspective in terms of each one of their lifetimes, what they encountered, the, the sig signature events of, of how society was behaving toward them. And when I looked at it from my standpoint, from where I was in time and history, it was very, I don't know that <clears throat> any of them faced the type of change that we were in the middle of. You can't have a society with separate classes. It's not good for us. I don't like it. I don't like to live in a society where, you know, there are certain classes based on anything, especially color of your skin. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. We got a lot of things that we might not have gotten in terms of a community getting street lights and sewer systems and uh, parks and things like that. It was bad in the sense that there is no such thing as communities anymore in Miami. Communities that where everyone knew everyone else. So we got a lot of people that bit the bullet, that held on because they knew better times was coming. Overall it was much better for all of us. We'll all benefit from it in the long run. But to get there, we had to go through some, some real agony. I tell people that they have to remember that it may not be 100% of a success within the school setting, but integration is far more than just the school. You know, when we're talking about, again, not being able to go to a doctor's office, not being able to go into a grocery store, not being able to go into a church, but being able to make those choices 
Integration without any doubt has worked and it continues to work. Thank goodness that I think enough time has gone by that we've overcome a lot of the hurdles. Still got a long way to go, don't get me wrong. Um, but I think we've come overcome the hurdles from, from absolute, I'm not going to sit in the same classroom with that black dude, to, hey, he's not a bad guy, at least I can sit in the classroom. You know, that's a major hurdle that has happened. The people who I was fortunate enough to share my path and my, you know, my life path with, there are many of them. Uh, they came from all walks of life. Some were white, some were, you know, other persuasions ethnic, ethnically. But the one thing that they all had, they were human first. They realized the value of having what I call a shared sense of humanity, where we are responsible for each other. And if we lose sight of that, I don't care what level, I don't care what job you have, I don't care what position you hold, if you lose sight of that, you're dead already. You're dead to your family, you're dead to the community that you live in, you're dead to the state, you're dead to the nation that you call your country. You just haven't been buried in the ground yet. So, for me, I want to see a generation that wants to live, that wants to innovate, that wants to take America where America has never been but, but needs to go. And that would be my challenge to you and your generation and every other generation coming by. Yeah.